This is a Stock Trading Reality Podcast, episode 101. Well, I forgot about it. I just left it in the account. I thought it like, I treated it like the Fidelity account. I was like, yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. And anyway, about six months later, I looked on this thing and that joker done made me $90,000. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, wants to visit Alaska, but the Grizzlies have him a bit nervous. Play Trader. I know I've said this in past podcasts, but these fun facts are always just, they are where they are. There's not put in a place strategically or anything like that. So... If you listen to the entire interview, you'll see that this kind of goes hand in hand with this in terms of adventurous. But yes, I would like to get up to Alaska at some point, uh, but you, know, you hear about the, the grizzly bears and the attacks and then the videos. Uh, I think I was scarred as a kid. There was some guy that like lived among the grizzlies and then and he was doing like documentation on it. And so he had cameras all over the place. And then one of the times a camera, one of his cameras caught a bear like going into his tent at night and like mauling him and this was all caught on video and it was just, yeah, so I don't know. I wanna get to Alaska but due to that, you know, horrific grizzly you bear face scene. face your fears. I know, I do, I need you're to face my fears. You're scared of the ocean, you're scared of the bears, I mean, do you just I am. stay in I'm your house all day, sh- Clay? Yeah, I don't know, I've, I'm curled up in a little ball right now under my desk, that's <laughs> that's the podcast location that I always do, and I'm surrounded by guns and ammunition right now, just in case I hear any sort of you know creak or, or noise or anything, but uh, Chez, I know this is a, a, I don't even know why I'm wasting time asking you, given that you now live in Denver, which is kinda like where the Rockies are, um, I'm assuming that you would be all for getting up to Alaska and doing some hiking and adventure and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I actually had um, family who was stationed there and, you know, I would talk to them and I'd see them over the holidays or something. And they would talk about how hard it was that, you know, my my uncle actually drove up there multiple times. And, you know, the essentially when you get stuck or stranded out there, you know, you need to be prepared in the car. And he said how, you know, it's drastically different because everybody is helpful because it can actually be life or death. If you get stranded on one of those ice highways, you know, for days at a time, if you're if you're not able to stay warm and stay, you know, hydrated and able to eat, you'll die. So anybody passing by, everyone is super helpful because, you know, it's pretty much you versus nature out there, not even in terms of bears, just the weather. But, yeah, I, w- I would love to kind of take a trip up there personally as well. But, um yeah. yeah, well, you might be scared of bears. Um, when we lived in California, still, I would take the dog hiking, and uh, I actually saw for the first time a tarantula, and I felt like it was the size of a hubcap, and <laughs> I was like, oh, we're turning around. I don't even want to try to go around this thing because I feel like it's going to jump in my face. But, yeah, you might not like bears. I don't like spiders. That's my thing. Yeah, well, but you called me out. There's, I don't like sharks. I don't like snake. I mean, I guess what, what aren't I afraid of is, is the key question, uh, but... Today, this is a good segue into our interview. We have a very adventurous person that we're gonna talk to. uh, And I I mean, Chez and I both fully, I mean, this is a great interview. Uh, Is this person making millions of dollars? No, Uh, they actually had a really good trade. uh, But they're a hard worker and they're just doing what needs to be done. And uh, they're bluntly honest. And uh, he had Chez and I laughing and it was a good time. So I'm not gonna offer up any spoilers. Other than, um, yeah, this is uh, this was a genuine good time. Some good bits of uh, wisdom, you know, just through kind of experiences of what not to do and what you should be doing. And we're going to be talking with Lewis today. Lewis um, has been a member, uh, I don't know, probably about a year now. Um, but we'll get into all those details as we, uh, you know, kind of go through the journey. But uh, he definitely has the best ever in terms of how did he hear about the market. So let's hop right in with Lewis. Lewis, welcome to the show. Uh, no problem. How you doing today? I'm all right. Hanging in there now. We we had a little technical difficulties, but sounds like you have a pretty tech savvy wife, so she was able to uh, to to figure out the whole mic situation. Yeah, she figured it out. I was sitting here messing with it, and that Joker just went and worked. But she got the Joker to work, huh? Yeah, she got it to work. Now I have to ask because I like the way you talk. Where are you at geographically? Uh, I'm about um, an hour and a half from Louisiana. I'm Texas side. 
So you're from Texas, but almost Louisiana? Yeah, it's on pretty close to the border. Chaz, it sure is nice to have some Southern folk on here, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like we don't uh, we don't have that many from the South that we generally interview. That's true. Yeah, I'm trying to think. R.D. from Arkansas. Um, yeah. Oh, and Alex, then all those Canadians up north. Yeah, we have way. So it's good to get a, a good Southern American here rather than all these Canadians that we've been having. So um, in all seriousness, though, thank you very much again, Lewis, for joining us. And uh, you mentioned you'd listen to some of the past podcasts, so you kind of know what's coming your way. So let's just uh, let's hop right in. Um, I we didn't really talk at all before we got recording, which is always kind of the um, the the goal around here. That way, we keep this as realistic as possible, and it's just kind of like Ches, Lewis, and I are sitting around in a coffee shop, and we're just gonna uh, shoot the breeze a little bit. So, where did you all get started, Lewis? I mean, how did you learn about the stock market, and what got you uh, kind of intrigued enough to want to kind of take a little bit more action with it? Well, when I was started, when I was a little kid, um, I always I cut rice and uh, grow soybeans and uh, farm crawfish when I was a kid. And I always wondered what the, how the price moved on the crawfish because we'd get out there when the crawfish were really expensive and start catching more and more. And that really kind of got my interest because the price always changed on everything. You know, a bushel of rice would change and soybean would change. All the prices would change. So that's what really got me interested in why the price started moving. Now, that's pretty cool, actually, because you were witnessing, essentially, supply and demand from like as a child like firsthand you're witnessing it and you know like when it's most profitable to go out there so did you ever kind of ask anybody that you were doing this uh this fishing or anything with did you ever ask them why it moved or did you you know did anybody kind of tell you why things were moving as far as the price no all they would say all the old folks would say is the market now i kind of clue us what the market was like what and that's what kind of spiked my interest at first so i was like why don't we just sell everything when it's uh two dollars and fifty cents a pound versus Selling it was a dollar seventy five a pound, you know, and that's what kind of got me interested. I got a Ches. I mean, you're willing to weigh in and give your opinion, and that's fine if you don't agree with me. But out of all the, the you know the guests, and you know we've done now over a hundred episodes of all the guests, and you know that I've asked, you know how what, how did you hear about the, the the market? You know what got you interested? Lewis officially has, in my opinion, the best answer. What got him interested in the market was the price of crawfish. It, that that's I'm with you. I'm, you you thought that I'm was gonna, super I'm interesting. Gonna, I mean, is that's that's fascinating to me. It's it's definitely kind of like I said, the most hands-on introduction to the market because he's literally experiencing market prices change as a child. So yes, that's definitely the most interesting way. It isn't like uh, you know my boss told me to put my 401k in this mutual fund and blah blah blah. Not very cool. Lewis was experiencing it from as a child, you know, right from the get-go. So I think that's really awesome. I think it it's really cool as well that it kind of piqued his interest way yes. back then. Yeah. Yes. I was just gonna make that exact point. Is most people, I mean, they're in the field and they don't really think much of it. So that piquing your interest, like Chess said, that shows that you got some, you, you, you like numbers, you like, wait, well, what's going on with all that stuff? So uh, as your coworkers or whoever it was told, you know, oh, well, that's the market. So like you acknowledge at this point, well, what does the market mean? So what was kind of your next step? How did you eventually start to kind of more so learn about what quote unquote the market actually was and what it meant, you know, how it worked, all that good stuff? Well, um, the first time I ever actually seen it on a computer screen was uh, I was in Iraq at the time, and uh, I was in the MWR tent waiting in line to get all them fobbits out of line to get on the computer. And um, the fobbit was sitting there, and he was uh, looking on his trends I seen, and I started kind of noticing, and I talked to him for a minute while I was waiting in line, and he said he was buying stock and selling stock. And I was like, man, that's really interesting. And he's saying he makes money doing it that way, and it, that really spiked my interest into it. And now, what what did you say it was a fobbit? Yeah, a fobbit. Them are the people that don't go outside the wire. You know, they live on the fob, forward the base, operating basic. basically. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not all these. So you served. At, were you a marine or army or? I was in the army. Well, thank you for your service, sir. Appreciate that. So, all right. I'm learn now. I'm learning military lingo. How did you know that, Chez? I know more than you think, Clay. <laughs> yeah, you're like uh, I, I keep. I don't show all my cards all the time. That's yeah, the you're like the little creep. You're probably looking in my windows at me right now, and I don't even know it. I think you're in Denver, but anyway, I'm so, scoped in right now. Yep. So this <laughs> Fobbit, yeah, this, this Fobbit guy is on the computer making money, 
And I mean, did you just start to, you know, ask him more about it at that point? Or I mean, because I could totally see how that would pique your interest. I mean, you're in like literally the desert and some guy's making money on his computer clicking buttons. So where did you go from there? I confronted him and I asked him, what, what are you doing? And he goes, uh, I asked him what he did. He worked in the motor pool. So that classifies him as a pogue. That's a personnel other than a grunt. And I was a grunt. I always lived outside the wire. And, uh, well, anyway, he started telling me about the uh, stocks, how he was buying low and selling high. I was like, that sounds really good. That's what I kind of want to do. But he had the time to do it, but I never did have the time to do it because I was only at the fob for probably a day or two to get a shower and a hot a hot meal. And then I was off to go back, in the, back on patrol or back on what I was doing. And, um, well, like, anyway, that really spiked my interest. That really, and when I got home, that's what I was going to do, start learning about the stock market. And that was like in 2005. Yeah, I was just going to say, I figured with him kind of working, you know, inside the wire, essentially, he's got a lot more computer time than you, right? Oh, yeah, a lot more. I can barely get on there. Back then, we used AOL. And I <laughs> yep, <try> yep. <laughs> and I get on there, and I try to talk to my mom. I find a list of my buddies, and, hey, can you call- tell my mom I'm online so I can talk to my mom. So I haven't seen my mom in over a year, and I was, that's how I communicated every so often was talk to my mom on the in the MWR tent. Yeah, there you go. So um so obviously you kind of thought, you know, your interest was, was peaked as a child. You saw this happening kind of when you were um in the army as well with somebody else who was doing trading there, you know, at the base. Um so did you decide while you were still um in the army to actually kind of start putting on some trades and then just leaving them on like swing trades or did you say um as soon as I'm out of the military and I'm back home, um am I am I going to start trading then? You know, what what did what did your kind of thought process go from that? Well, uh, at first, I, when I got home, I got a job at the fire department, you know, working like that. And because uh, rice farming, it went, nobody farms rice over here in this area anymore. It's really hard living. And I couldn't do that. So I got a job and I got a 401 account and I sat down with Fidelity and they set my plan. I thought I was golden from there. So we set up a plan. I put money in it and they invested for me. And I thought I was, that was the key. So how did, I mean, you thought you were golden. It's Right now it sounds like they were setting you up, but I'm assuming it was not golden. What what exactly happened with this account that they got you all set up with? Well, um, I started looking at it. I started checking it every so often, and it, I was always losing money, you know. And and it was last year, about 2000, uh, 2016 in January, where I looked, and I was like negative 10%. And I was like, I can lose my own money. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trade my own stuff, you know. And so I started getting online, looking while the economy collapsed and stuff. And I was getting low at the time. And why is my portfolio looking like garbage? And then I found this website. It was called the Dollar Vigilante. Don't go there because they sent me down the. It was okay, I guess. And they told they told me to invest in gold, and that was my first trade. Investing so, in so this this site was it uh, an email newsletter that you signed up for, or was it like something that literally showed up in the mail? What exactly, or was this like some sort of software that was supposed to tell you when to buy, when to sell? What exactly? You've already given the disclaimer. Don't go there. But I mean, for listeners out there, maybe they could, maybe they're looking at something similar, if not maybe the same site right now. Um, so what exactly was it? It was a a hedge against the dollar type of thing like end of the world crisis and they send you stock alerts when to buy and when to sell and yes so so so, so you get it so, yeah yeah so essentially you get in this gold trade it's the buy and sell alert service thing how does this because uh, the world's going to end right that's why yeah. their premise was the world was going to end yeah pretty much the world's going to end and you could buy gold and silver to hedge against inflation <laughs> the thing is, you're buying gold and silver in a trading account where if the world ends, it's not like you had it anyway. So it's not like it's in your garage or something. I, I always love exactly. that logic. But uh, yeah, well, so, I didn't so think any- about that at the time. And I was no, no, right, that's, right. Yeah, no, no, we, we're, yeah, we know. Chez is definitely not judging. We're just, I, I, we both give you credit for just admitting that. And that's why we both love the show because it's like, hey, people are just, they keep it real. And sure, maybe things aren't exactly, uh, you know, logical. But like you said, at the time, you weren't actually thinking logical at the time. So it is what it is. So sorry to cut you off, Chaz, but uh, this this no, is no, good stuff. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess first off, did you put your whole account kind of into this trade? 
I put it, I had $102,000 I put in the, they say buy J Nug. It was like going for $4 oh or something odd cents. And I was like, all right, I'm buying it. And I, I bought $102,000 worth of uh, J Nug. That's yeah. a big position. <laughs> Chess, did you yeah. hear that number? Yeah, I'm trying to contain myself over here because that's uh, I, I mean, I was like, yeah, I expect him to put like a good I, portion I mean, of his Chaz, portfolio I'm not a in, math- but that's like the whole thing in a four dollar gold stock. Yeah, I mean, I'm and I'm not a mathematician, Chess, so correct my check, double check my math here, but that would be a six digit amount into a single trade, which you just noted is at like four dollars. Is is my math right there, Chess? Six digits. Yeah, he's got a five-digit share position on it too. So just to be, so it's not just like a thousand shares. This is like twenty-five thousand shares. Just to be clear. Yeah. So, and then, <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat here, literally. So okay, here we go. So what happened next then? Well, I forgot about it. I just left it in the account. You, you know, forgot was, about a hundred two thousand dollar position? Well, well, I didn't forget. I knew it was there. It just I, thought, like, I treated it like the Fidelity account. I was like, okay, yeah, that's fair good enough. Stuff. Fair enough. Just, just parking it. Yeah, he's just parking it. He'll check back later. Yeah. Fair anyway, enough. about six months later, I looked on this thing, and that Joker done made me ninety thousand dollars. I was like, golly. <laughs> I looked on there. I was just happy to look, and then everybody at work wanted to get on on it, and I was like, all right, I, I sold mine instantly because I knew that could have went the other way. You know, and it's just I got on there. I seen ninety thousand. I didn't even know what the chart was really looking at. And I just hit this. What call? Actually, I was calling Fidelity to get them to sell it at ninety thousand dollars. I didn't have a computer. I didn't use a computer at the time. You know. I was, hey, I, I'm mm. sure that you were. You had no problem with that forty-five dollar call to kind of get an order posi- You know, place on the ninety thousand dollar profit you just made. So okay, well, well, obviously that was a good place to kind of park your money and check back uh, six months later. So. Now, I guess I gotta, the real question what, go ahead, go ahead. Just ahead. before we move on, Chet, what I found interesting is everybody at work wanted to get into JNUG at that point, but you said you were selling at that point. So did they realize that when everybody was piling in, you were selling? Did they understand that or did I mis- misunderstand what you said there? Yeah, they wanted into it. I was going to buy back into it, but I wanted to make sure I didn't lose anything. So oh, I started- okay. I wanted to start playing rational, and then that really speaked my interest when I had ninety thousand dollars. It was like okay. ninety one and some change. I forget the exact number. Cause, cause that would have been super. Go ahead. I was uh, pumping up J Nug like, look at this, showing everybody my account, and everybody was really extremely happy. Like, golly, let's get into this because you have to sign this waiver form on the internet on Fidelity to even play it. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Yeah. I was like, yes, this is the greatest stock in the world. And I was thinking about making T-shirts and everything. Yeah. And <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so needless to say, you're pretty fired up about it. Oh, yeah, that got my interest. And then that's when I found Play Trader online when I started researching it on YouTube. Okay, let me let me tra- stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Why? Because this is, this. I'm not saying this in a bad way, but this absolutely blows my mind is why in the world were you researching on the internet if you had just made ninety thousand dollars, because if I'm being if I'm being honest with myself, um, and Chez, I want you to weigh on this too. But if I was brand new, which you were, and I had just made ninety thousand dollars on a, a a stock, I don't know if I would feel like I needed to be doing any research, especially to like try to learn more or anything. I'd, I'd feel like, hey, I got this all figured out. So I mean, Chez. Do you think That's, you would feel that way too, or would you? That was still... the exact uh, direction I was heading. This was that uh, did did I wanted to ask him? You know, did you feel like you know you had this whole thing figured out? Now you're just going to find another you know big name, put your you know one hundred ninety three thousand dollars into this trade, and then check on it in six months. But obviously, you know, we already kind of spoiled it that uh, Lewis starts looking around for for education. So why? What exactly were you looking for? Did you kind of recognize that you wanted to kind of get better at this or be more active, and you you want a day? Trade? Trade? Did you see some videos or some advertisements for something? What what exactly led you to go from making a good amount of money to realizing, hey, you know, I should probably learn some more? Uh, the reason, because there's this guy at work said, you're going to get burnt by that stuff. You know, and I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, it may be true because that could have went the other way. And I could have been sitting with $10,000 in my account versus having an extra ninety. And I was like, man, maybe let me check on some things. And I found like stock twiz and and, and I started just gathering all this information up. Stock Quiz was like my number one. I had a big app on it on my phone. 
and I was ready to trade it. And, and I was back in the game. I, my, my strategy was, I start learning about strategy. If I go on stock quiz, the more bullish, they write bullish on there on the stock quiz. And if it had more bullish things, it was good to go. I'd put some money into it. <laughs> <laughs> for our listeners out there I, I love it me and Chaz oh this is great I'm absolutely loving every second of it stock twits is what you meant right or is there a stock or is there a, a site called stock twiz I could because maybe there is but stock I'm assuming twits. you mean stock twits he's talking yeah, stock called. twits yes uh, right. Sorry, from, from this point forward Chaz it is now going to be known as stock twiz because that's a much better name for it so Lewis is on stock t- Twiz, and are you still focused on JNUG, or are you just looking around for different, you know, new stocks to trade? No, it was just JNUG. At the time, I, that's all I cared about was JNUG. Okay, and what, what did stock Twiz, what purpose was that serving in your trading of JNUG? Well, if I had more green, more people say green, I was going to throw my money in that morning and let it ride, and every day I'd check it, and if it had more green, it says bearish. Bullish, bullish, bullish. I, I I was comfortable with it, and if, if I started seeing uh, bearish, a lot of bearish, I would I'd, I'd sell it. So I had to check in the morning and see how much <laughs> what it would do. That was my thought. That was my strategy. And huh. Them people don't know anything on there. <laughs> I mean, I love the honesty. Bless your heart for just laying it out there. What you're doing, because yeah, that that's just um, yeah. Hey, more people said bullish, so I'm gonna buy. So. <laughs> At what point did you decide, all right, I need to do even more than this? Because I'm assuming stock twiz eventually didn't work out for you. So did a bad trade happen? Or how did you eventually stumble across Clay Trader, which you mentioned a while ago? So what brought you to that point um, where you eventually, I, if I remember right, you bumped into Chez in the, in the customer service chat room. But you know, what took you all the way up to that point? Well, I was sitting there and I, I, I was on, on the internet and I've done, had, I had a couple losing trades. And I was like, man, I just, I was just really disappointed in myself after losing, you know, a fair share of money. I, I think I lost probably, I don't know, six, seven thousand dollars, you know. And I was really disappointed in that stock quiz, you know. And I, uh, I deleted the app. I was like, I'm not messing with these jokers anymore on this. And uh, there you go, bravo. And I started looking on YouTube and I typed in J Nug. I said, this will teach me something. And I, if I didn't know anything, like change a tractor part or change you know boat motor part or something i always get on youtube and it always lit it it always helped me out there when i needed in a bind and um well i was on uh, youtube and i typed in jnug and i hit a search and an old older video of clay traders came on jnug and I, that was my first video i clicked and i clicked it and i watched it and it was in the in the past and I started, and then I clicked on his page, and I started going through all the free ones, free videos, and I learned about candlesticks, and he didn't have a free thing on candlesticks, but I found it on the other, another site, and I was trying to piece this all together, and that's where I kind of started. And then, obviously, you came to this site. Now, um, you, didn't, you didn't join the inner circle or anything right away, right? You were just kind of checking out the site and what it had to offer? Yeah, I had to check what it had to offer, and I was like, and I was sitting there, I was like, looking at the different uh, prices, and I could pick this one, this one, you know, I'm cheap by nature, and I was like, oh, I don't really want to splurge for this class, because I needed that new Benelli shotgun I wanted, and, um... Benelli, nice, <laughs> nice, yep, anyways. And I was like, oh, I'll hold off, and I'll just use the free stuff, and I got to a point where the free stuff quit working, and... And then you came on to the uh, the support yeah, so, chat, and now now I remember having this is the opening dialogue with you, Lewis, and that's where you told me you doubled your account holding gold, and I said, "Dude, stop what you're doing, stop your trading." You told me you lost a couple thousand dollars, and I go, "Remember, you're still up what eighty four thousand dollars from where you were, anyways." Um, Take some time, invest some of those profits into your education, and just like you said, hey, I get it. You know, you want to buy a new shotgun. You know, you it's a for some people, it's a lot of money to kind of outlay it first, but and you definitely push back, and it's totally understandable. But um, so then, didn't you? I forgot. Did you get your feet wet with one of the courses, or what'd you do? I know, I know, it was like pulling teeth talking to you in the beginning, Lewis. <laughs> but me and you warmed up to each other after a while. 
Yeah, uh, I ended up buying the full course, but this was afterwards, after I got the inner circle. I got the inner circle thinking I'd just, you know, kind of look and see what's going on there on the inner circle and see what the other people were doing. And, and when I seen that, I didn't understand one thing that was going on in the inner circle. I was like, man, I just sat back and looked. And if I, and, you know, I'd try to ask a couple questions here and there. And then, you you know, no people, <laughs> people would always reply, you need to get the course. I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> well, I, I want to kind of backtrack because you made an interesting statement. You were trying to use free information. I mean, welcome to the club. But then you made the you know, inter interesting statement. The, the, the free stuff or the free education stopped working. What do you mean by it stopped working? You know, d Dig a little bit deeper into that because that, that's pretty interesting. I think something um, that a lot of people would probably benefit from hearing because as we always say, you know, if, if the free education thing truly did work, success rates would be higher than 10%. So what do you mean in your specific journey, free education stopped working? You know, dig more into that. Well, um, the free education part, it shows you how the candlesticks work. Okay, they don't show you, you know, patterns to be trading on. That's a, a thing. They show you like a little thing, but they don't go in detail on it. Another free education thing, they do like the support resistance, but they don't tell you what's happening if it's overextended or is it overbought or undersold. They don't tell you any of that stuff. So, you know, say you got like a bull pennant pattern or something and you see it's really, really overextended, you know, what? they don't tell you any of that. It just kind of cut you short on the free education stuff or, or buy this uh, class. I mean, I think you really nailed it on the head when you said, you know, it, it only goes so far. They'll give you, you can see kind of a sliver of the whole thing, but um, it's not enough to kind of put the pieces together. And Clay and I always say this all the time, there is an immense amount of information out there in the world, but the problem is it's not in a logical, structured way. You can jump around at 30 different trading sites and gather information, but it just comes out to like this jumbled soup of stuff that you have no idea how to sort it into like a table of contents in a book. So, so I can completely understand how it's like, just like you said, you know, you sure, great, you learn about support and resistance, but you have no idea now, you know, what's a logical entry, what's a logical place for a stop loss. You know, there's a lot of things that go into trading, and you know, by no means am I saying trading is easy, but at the same time, it's not that it's rocket science either. It's just there's kind of an order of things you got to look at. Would you agree with that, Lewis? Yeah. And there, there's a big order of systems to go through. And, um, yeah, if you don't have it in order, it's not really a strategy. You know, if you say, I'm going to buy on a support line and sell at a resistance line, but it don't tell you the overextendedness or what's really going on with the stock or your level twos, you know, you can use that. They don't go any over any over that. And that, that's very important, I think, using your level twos. Yeah, there's there's mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts. I think what we're all getting at here is a lot of moving parts, and I, I like Chuz's uh, soup analogy. You know, you, you go and gather all that stuff, but that also assumes, I mean, Chez gave the benefit of the doubt. He assumed that all the bits of information you're gathering were actually good bits of information. I mean, that's hard enough in and of itself, but uh, yep. even, even assuming that all those bits are good, so we'll give you, you know, the thing that's almost impossible to do anyways, but even at that point, if you, you know, kind of overcome the impossible, you still got a, it's still just soup. It's all jumbled together. There's no rhyme or reason, but we won't beat this dead horse anymore. I know we've been talking about it uh, in recent episodes too, but so you join the inner circle, you start asking questions. People are saying, oh yeah, you know, if you want to, you know, learn more about this, get that course, get that course. So at this point, um, did you get the courses or did you hop back in the, the chat room with Chess and start to uh, push back a little bit? Or where did you go from that point after being a member of the inner circle for a while? Well, um, I was like, well, I, I said, I ain't going to pay for these expensive courses. You know, I'm, I'm going to find something cheaper. And I, I did. I found something cheaper in it. I regretted it. And I came back to the, uh, to the system and to buy uh, Clay Trader University. And I just went out. I was so frustrated with the other person I bought. I just said, I'm going Don't tell me who here. it is because I don't want to drive any traffic their way. But what made, what out of curiosity, this is just me, you know, remember, we're just shooting the breeze in a coffee shop here. What made it so frustrating? Because, I mean, you've paid for it, but, I mean, I mean, go go a little bit deeper into that. Well, I didn't understand anything he was saying. And that was the first thing about it. I, I didn't quite get the concept of what he was saying. And it just didn't make any sense to me. And then 
I did my research on him, and he don't even trade. <laughs> so it was kind of like, man, I supposed to waste it fifty dollar. It cost fifty bucks. <laughs> hey, hey, you. I, I'm a firm believer, and I wasn't for a long time that you kind of get what you pay for. But uh, <laughs> I, I'd like to say that we welcomed you back with open arms, didn't we? Yes, y'all did. I was. You you I had like to I, you had to take a look and hey we we've, we've all been there you got to kind of try the water see what's out there see what's around so you have a bad experience you realize hey I you know I like what Clay did with the free material we'll give a try for his premium content so uh, so what did you do now did you just start going binge going through all the courses or you know what uh, what is your what are you what's your plan now for trading you're gonna take some time off and uh, do some learning or are you gonna try to learn and trade at the same time and make another ninety thousand dollars what what's your plan Lewis? Well, my plan was I was going to, uh, I started doing the courses. I said, well, let me take a, I, I put my brakes on it. I was like, you know, I ain't going to risk all this money I done made for, because I was retarded at the first time. You know, that was very, very I look back at it now and think, man, that was retarded putting all of, all them years of work on JNUG, the lever GTF, like that. And I didn't even know what that was when that's when I got it. And, um. So I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and I want to uh, take some time to learn learn some things before I actually start trading again. And that's what I did. I stopped and I started learning. And while I was learning, I was trying to do this paper trading. And I'd sit in here and I'd paper trade at the time when I was learning, trying to put my new strategies together. And I printed everything off on my stuff and I'd put one and one and one together and and try a strategy. You know. That's what I would do. So talk more about paper trading. How exactly did you paper trade? Was it uh, kind of like caveman style where you're literally writing things down on paper or did you have a, a platform like a demo account that was letting you do things? Uh, it's been a while since we've talked about paper trading. So what exactly was your strategy? How did you execute uh, you know, your paper trading? Well, I'd go on, uh, after I watched a course, you show how to uh, find these stocks. So like I'd watch one like RVR, you know, I'd find one that hit the uh, the 52 and had some back uh, pullbacks to it, and you know I set up RVR to it, so I try to make some money that way. And I I have a, a notebook, and I say I want to enter here, I want to exit here, and I have my spreadsheet that y'all y'all provide me, and I'd put it in there, make sure my stop loss was good, and then I'd wait. I'd try swing trading these things instead of because I'm I'm pretty busy because I got a I got a job and the fire department i got i got and then on my days off i usually shoe a bunch of horses and um i'm a farrier too and then i'm trying to do this well so swing trading kind of kind of what i want more wanting to do a swing trade so i was trying to swing trade these these pullbacks on these recent highs and that was my first go about doing things trying to get everything started established was my first trade uh, strategy so you were using pretty much a notepad, so caveman style. You would write down literally with a uh, pen into this notepad and you would just go with that, so nothing fancy at all. Yes, and you know, and I'd like, say I had the, you know, can we say the st strategy, like my panic buy strategy, I'd set it up and look for a particular stock that met that criteria and and that's what I, that was my first strategy to try. And, and when I got comfortable with that strategy, I'd move on to the next strategy. And so nice, on, I like on. it. A very systematic approach to to go through the courses, and uh, as you didn't step into the bear trap that Chess sent for or that set for you about. So, did you trade with real money as you try to learn? No, you were learning and trading, but you were paper trading, which means you know no money was actually at risk. So, I uh, I, I like the systematic and he approach. He was paper trading very very efficiently. He was yes. literally writing it down, keeping it accountable, double checking his risk and stuff like that. So I'm very happy to hear that from the man who just kind of parked a hundred thousand dollars in the trade, <laughs> yeah. you know, made a good amount of money too. Now he's literally <laughs> methodical about it. Knows what his time constraints are. Knows the strategies he wants to put in place. So this is this is great. Yeah, and I just want to circle back. Did I understand that right? Currently, you have three jobs. Yeah, I, cause I work around. Cause I work shift work, and um, working shift work, I'm I have time, a lot of time off, and I'm a farrier. But that's what I like to do on my days when I'm not at work. That supports my uh, my insurance, and my, you know they pay for my insurance. My four, cause I trade only on my four hundred one, and I'm starting to put a little bit of money into another account to start trade. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I want to I want to venture off in options. That's what I'm kind of 
on now is my options going back over that and, and right now i'm kind of messing with options and because i can't short on the 401 account and but i but i'm planning on doing that with this new account i'm putting money back toward so i like the idea first off that um i think a lot of people kind of come to this you know it's almost like a fork in the road where they say hey you know i originally got into the market with my 401k accounts and it's great for my retirement but at the same time, you know, you can't really take it out without a huge penalty um, if you want to, say, supplement your income or if, say, say you're doing really well trading and swing trading in your IRA. Um, like I said, it's great for your retirement, but you can't sometimes see the fruition of that for 30, 40 years, depending on how old you are. So so I love the fact that you're kind of setting money aside for a different account. Um, and now at the same time, you said you're kind of getting interested in options, too, because first off, um, you know, even in your IRA, you could actually, you know, you could get short using options with, you know, puts or whatever else. There's a lot of strategies you could do. Um, but I'm assuming you're saving up money now for just a regular margin account, right? So something yes. you could kind of trade and take money out of all the time? Yes, I want to open up a more. I already did. I put, I only put like four grand in there, but I want to see what I could do from a small account to a big account. That, you know, kind of that concept that y'all had on one of y'all's uh, YouTube channels. And I, I, I thought that was very interesting. So that's where did that four plan. grand, where did that four grand come from? Those three shoeing jobs. Horses. <laughs> yeah, shoeing horses. You said something that caught my eye, and I can see younger listeners, I can see some people think, wait, did he just say he put only $4,000 into account? Only? $4,000 is a lot of money. It is. And you know how Lewis got that $4,000? He worked. He's sweating. He's putting in sweat equity. He's not sitting here saying, well, I don't have $4,000. I only have 50 bucks. Therefore, $50 into a Forex account. Let it ride. No, he got that $4,000 through working. And I'm, I'm gonna try to just hold back and not rant, but the amount of people that will, you know, I, I only have $500, I only have $250, is that enough to start trading? And as soon as you tell them, no, it's not, well, I guess I'll just have to do penny stocks. I mean, their conclusion is, well, I, I gotta just find the money where I can kinda go all in and then hopefully to grow. People, listeners, Lewis's, I, I mean, I'm ready to tackle somebody. That's three jobs. Think about that. So yeah, I <laughs> this is only this is three out. jobs after he made ninety thousand dollars. Okay. Yes. So yeah, just exactly. to keep in mind, he didn't say, "Oh, I'm on easy street now." He still works to this day three jobs and was able to kind of fund a second account with you know proceeds from one of these jobs. And yeah. I just love how you said sweat equity because that's the truth. Sweat equity. Yeah. So well done, Lewis. I mean, that's that's a great example. That's motivating um, and. Uh, and I'm not implying that all you listeners out there are lazy bums. I'm just saying that there are no excuses. And this is why Chez and I always preach there are no excuses. Uh, you know, if you want something bad enough, then then go and get it. And Lewis clearly is fascinated by the soul trading stuff and, and the quote unquote market going back to the crawfish days. And he's doing his hardest to make it work. So it's one thing to say, oh, I'm super interested in that. I'm super passionate. But when Lewis says that, it, he's easy to believe when you hear about you know the, the the three jobs he's working. So, anyways, due to your three jobs, due to your work ethic, you now have quote unquote only four thousand dollars that you put into a margin account. So, have you been trading with that, or is that still kind of just something you set aside? Some I set aside. I'm still. I, I want to hit the. I want to hit ten thousand dollars in it before I start doing anything with it, and that's my goal. And okay, so do you have like a budget set up? Do you like do you set aside a certain amount of money per month to put in that account, or? No, I just um whatever what what I've been doing with my horseshoe with what what I don't have it what I all the supplies I buy if I, all the money left over I'll put it in that account so it depends how much I'm shoeing and it depends if I'm working uh, more at the one of my other jobs and I, it just it just varies you know because I cause my other job we work shift work we work it's a crazy schedule it's, I work uh, four nights and then I'm off for three and then I work. Uh, three days and then I'm off one and then I work three days, three nights and I'm off three and I work four days and then I'm off seven. It's, okay. It's kind of a weird, weird schedule right there, working yeah. nights and days, swapping back and forth. Okay, yeah, and that, then, that makes sense. I guess the point of the question was, and now it makes sense, 
Because I mean, if you have a steady paycheck and steady amounts of money that are coming in, then you can easily project how long it would take you to go from 4,000 to 10,000. But like you just said, everything's kind of mishmash, so you can't really do projections yeah, like is, that within your personal finances. this is drastically different than, you know, somebody who gets a, the same amount every two weeks, you know, for 52 weeks of the year or something. So yeah, yeah. De- definitely different. But it sounds like, you know, what he does is essentially after his expenses, he's got money left over. And obviously, you know, he can pay his rent and has money for food and gas and insurance and all that stuff. Um, the rest of the proceeds, he just, you know, putting into the account and he'll get there when he gets there. And, uh, you know, like you said, the more work he does shoeing or for whatever what the other jobs are, um, he's got more proceeds and he'll be there sooner than that. But where I wanted to kind of go is that have you been now, you said you were kind of, are you going to trade options in that margin account or are you just going to trade stock like you were before? I'm going to trade options and I'm going to try shorting. I'm, I've been paper trading a lot of shorting and um, I've been doing pretty good with it. And, and I can... Like say J Nug, I can go to play J J Disc, and that's kind of a short I do with my uh, four because my four hundred one account don't let me short, and so I gotta go with J Disc and go long on J Disc versus shorting J Nug. That's free stipulations on my four hundred one account that won't let you do that. Have a margin. Yeah, that that would make sense. Uh, I wanna before I forget. A while back, you emailed me about um, you had taken a loss on a trade, um, and it was a, a, yeah, it was a loss. But some of the buddies that you work with or something, I mean, their losses were just astronomical. Do you do you remember what I'm referring to here? Yes, it was the uh, J Nug trade, and, and I, I kind of had a little pattern going. I bought at the little uh, little bit of it, and I, and then well, anyway, I bought the bottom of the. I was going to do a speculation, but that was my strategy. I was going to speculate it was going to break. And um, everybody at work jumped in on it. They were like, and they're like, are you buying? I said, yeah, because I don't tell them my strategy, what I'm doing. You know, and they're all excited, like, all right, Lewis is buying. Lewis is buying. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm buying. I put it, I put the buy in on it, and um, and I put my stop loss. I didn't tell them where I put my stop loss, <laughs> you know. So I like it. There. I like it. If they want to puppet trade you, they can go out in the wilderness on their own yeah i paid for this i ain't cheering it and well anyway and, I, and it was it seemed like a good trade set up for me and well i had the gap down that was the first time i experienced a big gap down like that and, and i had a, a uh my my uh sell order got hit my stop loss and it stopped where it opened up at and i was like man and i'm looking at all them guys over there and they're really disappointed because they put like twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars in on it, and they're still hanging on to this day, on it, you know, hoping for the best. <laughs> and they're down ten, eleven thousand dollars. Some of them are. It's a whole bunch of people, and they still don't want to learn how to trade. But you took a loss on, and I, this is why I always like the story. And I remember, you know, talking about it to the Clay Trader University students on one of our uh, live webinars. But sure, you took a loss on it, but because you had that stop loss in there and because you were disciplined, yes, you were wrong, so therefore, yes, you took a loss. But as you just noted, you're, 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 I, don't, I, I don't know if I wanna use the word poor buddies because it's kind of self-inflected, but your buddies um, to this day are still holding on to that thing and they are down a whole lot more than what you ever lost on it, right? Oh yeah, they're, they're down 10,000. They don't even, they're like, they're stuck with it. They can't do anything except hope. I don't like having hope. <laughs> Nor do I, my friend. Yeah, so point here, such a, a difference from Lewis from back then that was using stock twiz, like, all right, that most people say bullish, okay, bearish, and now he's got stop losses in, he's got risk management, in, or he's you know deploying risk management. Um, so a risk uh, conscientious trader versus non-risk conscientious traders, and you see the difference there, hopefully through this story and why I like it so much, is your buddies are still just uh, crossing their fingers and you've moved on a long time ago and uh, you know because you kept your risk uh, under control. So again, to the listeners, nothing wrong with being wrong when you're trading. Everybody's gonna be wrong, no trader is perfect, but just acknowledge you're wrong, take the loss, and move on. So where do you stand right now? We know that you're building up your margin account. Are you, trading um, you know, within your 401k still? I know you said you couldn't short, but I mean, where do you stand right now, present day, in terms of your trading? Uh, right now, I'm still trying to mount, uh, master master the balance strategy. You know, and That's kind of one of them things I'm trying to find a stock that will do it. I see on the newsletter y'all put out there, I still haven't 
hit one yet and um, that's what I really want to concentrate on now with my 401 manager in the bout but I'm still trading a lot of my uh, a lot of my strategies that I'm using and I, I use them on everyday everyday basis um, like my panic buy strategy and my momentum buy that's one probably my, one of my most favorite strategies the momentum buy and I'll use that when in my 401k account and uh, you know, I, I just think money. it's a, gr a great example too is that this that I, I try to make this point in almost every podcast so to the frequent listeners of this podcast I apologize in advance but um, this this is just another glaring example of why I truly believe that buy and sell services do not work because Lewis is listing off you know two or three strategies and keep in mind Lewis has access to probably like 25 strategies or more and that's just like kind of ones that Clay developed and you know by no means is any of this stuff rocket science but he knows what he naturally gravitates towards he knows how, how much risk he's willing to kind of put on in each of these trades kind of he knows where he's strong and where he's weak and what he needs to practice and work on and that's why I always say, you know, people who are just looking for this shortcut, this I want to, you know, just like your your buddies at work, you know, I, I take no pride and happiness in the fact that, you know, they got kind of stuck in that, that um, you know, that gap down. But, you know, you understand you invested in yourself you would rather not have not only your time tied up and become you know a, a bag holder for gosh knows how long um but also your capital tied up so you couldn't even do any more trading because you're just losing money every single day so so i just i i love that i and i really do believe that you know trading is such a kind of personal journey for people and they have to find where they kind of fit in the market so kudos to you for kind of taking the time and figuring out what strategies really drive with you you know what you have a good keen eye for so um, obviously you've been working on that now you're working towards kind of getting that ten thousand dollar account to kind of trade options um, but you know what what is your what do your charts look like what kind of indicators do you use you have bollinger bands moving averages you know what uh, are just looking at candlesticks what what does your chart look like Man, first of all, I always have my MACD set up, and um, I have my moving averages. So I, I probably should say that on this thing. I don't no, go for it. Go for it. it really? Just, I mean, if, if people if people want to try to puppet trade you, they're gonna get slaughtered. So you 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 just list it out, and if people want to take that information, and try to run with it, well, they can do so at their own peril. At, see, at first, I never used anything. I used a line chart, and then I start learning more and more, and. Uh, first, I have my moving averages to tell me which way the river's going, and I, I like using my MACD. That's my second thing on my thing. My Bollinger bands. I like knowing when stuff's overextended. Uh, I like I have my RSI up all the time, and uh, my money flow indicator. That's what I. That's one of the most things I, I look at to see if I can buy, and make sure everything's you know oversold and before I actually make an entry into something. I I make sure all these things are saying. I'm good to go. I just don't want to buy something that's overextended or something like that. Remember what I'm. That's how I set up my chart, and I and I, I go some multiple time frames. You know, and make sure all time frames say it's a good time to enter a trade. So, in other words, you have a good system then set up that uh, you're not you're not depending on other people whether they're clicking bullish or bearish at this point. It sounds like you're totally making the decision on yourself, and you know that's. Clearly the goal, that's uh, where we want to be. You know, here we go. Instead of having somebody hand you a crawfish, you want to go and learn how to catch the crawfish yourself, right? That's, that's the ultimate goal. Can you get behind yeah, that that's, analogy? That's the ultimate goal. Yeah, we want, we want to catch crawfish, not have and crawfish handed to us. And then on top of catching the crawfish, you want to sell it at the top or wherever the resistance is instead of at the bottom. So, I mean, this is all just <laughs> tying together here. Yeah, you got to sell those crawfish when they're 250 a pound. I mean, you can't wait for them to go down to a buck 25 or whatever you said those numbers were. I mean, you got to try to, you know, can you short a crawfish? I don't know if that's possible or not. I'm sure Wall Street could create a product if you really wanted yeah, them to. Crawfish to, futures, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, crawfish uh, futures. Y'all rate like crawfish? It. I have had them once, but they were like a couple days old, so I don't. I didn't get like the quite the experience that I think you're supposed to get. But I, I would like to get down to Louisiana at some point in my life, um, and definitely like do the crawfish thing where they just dump them on the table or however that works. Yeah, I love, I love, I love eating them, and um, crawfish. Well, that's probably why the the prices went up because you were eating them all while you did it, so you were you decreasing were, you were supply. The demand. Yeah, yeah, you were decreasing supply and increasing demand at the same time. You manipulated the crawfish market. So 
I don't know, the SEC may be knocking on your door here sooner than later, but anyways, what about, I like. I always like this question, and especially with people like you that are extremely blunt and will just shoot from the hip, but I mean, what are some strengths that you think you're doing very well at right now, and then what are some you know weaknesses, or maybe more politely put, some things that you realize that you still need to continue to work on? Um, things that I need to continue, what I'm really good at, I'm gonna say start right, like, like the momentum buys I'm pretty good at, um, the panic buy I'm really good at, and um, the dream crushers, you know, when I, I start seeing when the dream crushers are about to come in and to play, and um, the ruthless short I'm per- really good at there. When I start seeing that, I'm starting to fail, and I'm, per- I'm really good at them. Uh, weaknesses I have sometimes when I'm messing with real money, I, I don't know, I go blank sometimes. I try to move that stop loss as close as I can, and Every once in a while, it'll buy at me because I'll move it up. Like, I know it's not supposed to be there, but I'll move it up just to save a penny. <laughs> you know, being cheap, that, that tends to bite me every so often. Is When I start seeing me, I'm making money, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I better start moving that stop loss up, and I'll move it up. And a little too close, and I end up getting knocked out too early. That's yeah, happened yeah. to me quite a bit. That's uh, that's Real all money. part of the part of the voices and kind of learning how to how to deal with them essentially and kind of having faith in the plan. But you know that that's a completely normal thing with uh, with real money on the line for sure. But Lewis has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, obviously, you've come a long way from the guy who just parked a hundred thousand dollars in a trade and walked <laughs> Makes away. Makes me laugh every time. To uh, to a real you know systematic trader with a strategy and a plan, and you know takes his lumps, you know takes his losses and moves along like nothing ever happened. So for kudos to that, because like I said, to, I mean it's it's been like night and day considering when I first chatted with you to now when we're doing this podcast. So it's been a pleasure having you. But um, I know the real reason you came on here was to borrow my time machine. So if you were to borrow that, and you could go back to whatever time frame you pick. Uh, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself? Um, don't put everything you own in one stock. It's <laughs> probably what I sh- wish I wouldn't have done at first. But it could have went the total opposite for me. And as don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's what I'd say. And that's exactly what I did. Kind of, re- I don't regret it, but I kind of have that mixed emotions that it could have went the other way, and I could have, it could have went very south for me. And I wouldn't be talking to y'all now. I'd be fed up and didn't care about the market. And Clay, that kind of ties into uh, I forgot what podcast number it is. You know, um, where we were talking about kind of how people diversify and what mutual funds really are, and that essentially, wouldn't you agree that Lewis is saying, you know. essentially don't have all your eggs in one basket is diversify be spread out don't let one trade you know like you said it's it's amazing that you recognize that you know that trade could have went the opposite way and as fast as you made ninety thousand you could have lost ninety thousand and that account would be down to ten thousand so would you agree with that clay oh yeah it's it's amazing and we've heard it time and time again on the podcast that a lot of people have to learn that the hard way probably myself included if i'm being bluntly honest with myself where yeah you can be making money and you could have made money on a trade, but they always forget the fact that, you know, they don't stop and reflect and say, well, that, that could have gone the other way and I could have been absolutely crushed or I could be in a whole world of hurt right now. Um, and they don't think about that until it actually happens to them and they're in a world of hurt. So Lewis, I, I would say, is definitely in the minority in the sense of even after making, you know, stumbling upon some fool's gold, he, uh, well, you did listen, so props to you for listening to that guy. Whoever that guy was, you must have respected him a little bit that said, Lewis, you better slow down. You're gonna get burned bad uh, because maybe if you didn't stumble into him, uh, perhaps you would have had to really learn the hard way, but you stumbled into him, but more importantly, you heeded his advice. Um, so yeah, that I mean, a lot of people have to learn that because you're absolutely right. All it takes is, um, the stock price to go one other direction, and that could have been, your life could be literally a, a whole lot different right now. Maybe you'd be working five or six jobs. I don't know, but yeah. you listen to that guy, and um, you know from there, you've obviously uh, you know putting yourself on a new path. So now you're ready for some fun questions here, Lewis. This is where the real, true grilling begins. So are, are, are you braced? Are you ready to go? Yeah, go ahead. All right, this is gonna be intense. What is your favorite movie? I really don't watch that many movies that often. Of course, I, I, I don't. One. You're out working three jobs. Of course you don't. You're like the prototypical. No, there's no excuses. So I'll, I'll, I'll fully. 
I, I believe that 100%. I don't not see how that wouldn't be possible. But I mean, just humor us. Make a movie up if you want to. Uh, if, if I had to pick one, probably Batgraph. Well, I don't know. I classic. Like that. <laughs> yeah, it is a Kurt classic Russell. right there. Yeah. Yep. I always like well, Batgraph. Well, considering you do work all the time, I know you got to kind of keep yourself fueled up. So what would you say is your favorite meal and dessert? Crawfish, uh, man. What kind of stupid question was that, Chez? I eat crawfish, but I don't know. I eat a lot of stuff. I shoot ducks, geese, uh, deer. Um, that's probably one of my favorite stuff I get on my own. I'd rather eat that than eat at the store. Uh, that stuff straight up organic. Not only so. does he work for his money, he works for his food, <laughs> which makes it even more rewarding. Like, Lewis is a man's man. It's just as simple yeah, as that. Yeah, he's a freaking caveman. I like this guy. I mean, just... I picture him walking out from his cave with his club. Well, not, I was going to say his club, but really his Benelli shotgun. And yeah, he gets home from work in his three jobs, shoots something, and then uh, drags it, it back up. to the cave. Yeah, and cooks it up. I mean, man's man. I, that's a perfect way to put it there, Chaz. And a man's man in the world of trading. No excuses from Lewis. Hey, I, I'm, I got, uh, I'm only going to put in $4,000 into that margin account, and he's going to keep on building that thing up. So uh, that, 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 that's good stuff there, Lewis. Uh, this is very hopefully inspirational to people of what hard work and uh, just getting her done actually looks like. What about uh, ho hobbies? I mean, I, I stumble upon this question because I do you even have time for hobbies? When you do have some time available, what do you like to do for fun or hobbies? Man, I go to all sorts of places. I go to like Argentina, like my wife's from Guatemala and I hunt down there. I go hunting. I went, went to Argentina and shot a thousand doves in one day. And I like doing a that. A thousand I, doves. Yeah, I shot a thousand in one day there, and um, that's what I do. I do go you, and hunt. Do you trip. eat those doves, or is this just like something that they do for fun? That's what they do for fun down there. It, they're a nuisance in Argentina down here in ah, Texas. We eat them. So population control. Got yeah. this. Yeah. Population control. Yeah, I shot a thousand in one day. I couldn't believe. I never done that in my whole life. I just did that. And um, what's the biggest animal you've ever hunted, and in what country did it come from? Hell, I, I've uh, hunted alligator. I, my biggest alligator is probably 11, 11 one. I, Jeez. <laughs> Chez, I think we have a new uh, meet and greet location down in Louisiana. And hey, Lewis I is going to be Texas. our alligator hunting guide. Hey, oh, I live in Texas. Texas. Uh, Texas. All right, sorry. Yeah, Texas that's fine. I'll, I'll go down to you, Texas, yeah, too. Yeah, we'll go down. Well, where do you go gator hunting at, though? Louisiana? No, we, we can gator hunt right here in Texas. That's... <laughs> There we go. So sign up now for the uh, the next uh, inner circle meet and greet. We're gonna we're gonna gator hunting, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that we'll everybody see, doesn't we'll see how we fare. Unless yeah, if, we'll you know, use one IT of the get bait. eaten or something. Yeah, we'll yeah. Use <laughs> Nate is bait. We'll send him out there with some food attached to him or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, go ahead, I don't Lewis. even know where we are now. This is just oh yeah. I think you're up, Chez. Yeah, yeah. So Lewis, what uh, what would you say are three words you believe should be associated with successful trading? Successful trading, get get a real education. That's probably the most important thing about it. Um, yeah, that's three words. Get an educate. No, that's more than three words. No, you're right. Get, get an get education. Get you're right. Get an education. There we go. There, there you go. go. Hey, hey. <laughs> Short and simple, but very, very effective. Well, uh, Lewis, this was genuinely a, a very good time. Ches and I, we were talking in Skype, just kind of. In a good way, just like, oh, yeah, yeah. Chess was like, I remember him from your days of stumbling into the customer service box. And uh, I, I appreciate, I always thought you were from Boston for some reason. I don't know why I thought that, but awesome. you're not from Boston. You are from <laughs> uh, the South. So my apologies and my wrong assumption there. But um, thank you very much for hanging out with us. And uh, we'll definitely have to have you back on at some point um, to hear how things have, have continued to progress for you. But uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, no problem. I appreciate y'all inviting me on. Yeah, it was it was a good time for sure. For you listeners out there, a final few things before we go. If you're listening on YouTube, uh, click that like button, but also check out the remainder of the channel. Lots of other videos, live trading, uh, quick tip videos, just random type videos. Yeah, so check those out. Hopefully you decide to subscribe ultimately to the channel. If you're watching, or I should say listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, uh, then make sure to subscribe. And on iTunes especially, if you could leave us a, a rating, that really helps us out and goes a long way and truly is appreciated. And then finally, if you're listening on the site, 
then click that share button, leave us a comment below, we will respond and we'll you know reply and have a conversation with you if you want. So um, hopefully if you could do those things, like I said, that would really be appreciated. So thank you again to the, our co-host Chez. Thank you again for a great time with Lewis from Texas who's gonna take us alligating hunting. And thanks again to you as listeners. We'll this has been the week. Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.